I'm Lucy Beadnell with the ARC of Northern Virginia. This brief webinar on planning for a live-in caregiver is part of a series that parallels our live-in caregiver guides. This project was made possible thanks to a grant from the Arlington Community Foundation. This webinar will overview a rough timeline for putting a live-in caregiver in place based upon your current situation and getting a sense of the workload involved with having a live-in caregiver in your home. Timelines can vary pretty significantly based upon where you're living now and what you need. If you already have access to a home with a spare bedroom, you can put a live-in caregiver in place very, very quickly. However, if you're going to use a rent subsidy, like what used to be called a Section 8 voucher and is now commonly referred to as a Housing Choice Voucher, or the Virginia State Rental Assistance Program funds, other kinds of local, public, county, city, state, or federal funds, you may need to ask for a reasonable accommodation. We'll have a webinar that goes into this in the future in more detail. And you'll need to have someone in mind who can perform this work. So you'll need to start thinking with a little bit more time in advance. If you're applying for a rent assistance program like those I mentioned that doesn't currently have a waiting list, as you're applying, you need to be ready to ask for that reasonable accommodation so a live-in aide can have a bedroom to live with you, and you'll need to have someone in mind who's ready, willing, and able to accept that position and provide the documents needed to show that they're eligible for that work. So in that case, you would need to be moving on things very quickly. If you're applying for a rental subsidy program, like a housing choice voucher that has a very long waiting list, it's ideal to know in advance that you'll want a live-in aid and ask for that reasonable accommodation and to have someone in mind, but given the realities of the waiting list for those programs, which can be several years long, the person that you initially ask about performing that job may not ultimately be the person who you use. In terms of the work involved, you need to really carefully think about deciding whether or not this is right for you because there's a lot going on with hiring a live-in caregiver. If you have a Medicaid waiver, talk with your support coordinator and other people on your support team about finding and managing a caregiver. Through a waiver, you have several options. You could hire an agency to provide that caregiver. You could hire someone through what's called consumer directed services, in which case you have a whole lot more choice and control over the exact person who you hire, but also more responsibility for filling out their timesheets and following through with their work. If you don't have a waiver, or if the waiver is not able to provide for your needs adequately, you could hire someone with private pay, meaning using a special needs trust, an ABLE account, or other cash payments to hire the caregiver in combination with possibly free rent in exchange for them living in the unit with you. If you think this may seem like a good fit for you, your next step would be to start looking at a live-in caregiver agreement. See our live-in caregiver guide for an example of an agreement that you can use and tailor to your situation. You want to make sure that you train the caregiver on all the aspects of their job and make sure that training is in writing and that you're available to help support them as they learn that job in the future. Arrange for backup. That caregiver won't be able to be there every second of every day in scheduled time since we all get sick, take vacations, and at some point in our lives leave a job. Make sure you have alternatives in place. And if you haven't already done so, remember to ask for that reasonable accommodation if you're asking for public housing assistance to pay for a bedroom for this caregiver. For other work involved, think about whether or not you want to use an agency. Again, the agency has the benefit of another group of people being paid to support the timesheets and a lot of the record keeping requirements. However, it takes a lot of your individual choice and flexibility in hiring a caregiver away. So if you choose to use consumer-directed services or to pay privately for this care attendant, keep in mind that you're going to have to monitor, sign, and maintain their timesheets. You'll have to stay updated on changes to labor laws since that may affect how much you have to pay the person. So for example, if you're paying the minimum wage and the federal minimum wage changes, you need to be updated on that and make sure you're paying them appropriately. No matter what, make sure you have a long-term plan so that this situation is durable and sustainable and safe for you as you move forward in the future. And depending upon your situation, you may need to look at whether or not you're directly paying wages and taxes, or if your support team or waiver service providers are helping you do that. See another webinar in this series 
on taxes, Medicare, workers' compensation, and other work involved with being an employer for more details on these provisions. Feel free to check out the ARC of Northern Virginia online at thearcofnova.org. Ask us a question anytime at thearcofnova.org slash answers. Visit our series of webinars and other recorded bits of information on our YouTube channel. Check out our Transition Points page for information, toolkits, and resource guides across the lifespan, especially our Finding a Home Guide and printed it on lawn versions of the Live-In Caregiver Guide, the version both for people with disabilities and their families hiring a caregiver and the version aimed at caregivers themselves that can be used as an employee manual. Thanks for joining us.